Good morning, everybody. Um, I'm going to lay out um, into a headline form some of the things that may affect um, politics over the next 16 months up to the general election. Um, here's one of the things that we've been feeding into CEBR, um, which itself, I think, tells an interesting political story. Um, consumer confidence fell off a cliff not surprisingly, 2008, uh, you can bracket it from, if you like, from Northern Rock to Lehman Brothers. That um, roughly 12 months was when uh, consumer confidence went down. And if you look at Lehman Brothers, September 2008, that is when it hit bottom. And actually, after that, started to pick up because it was, of course, after Lehman Brothers that... Uh, um, Britain, America, and other countries started to take the action necessary to prevent a real global um, depression. But if you look at what then happened after that, so actually going up to roughly the time of the 2010 general election, there was quite a strong recovery. Um, this will come, I'm sure, as a less of a surprise to you here than it would to many people, because as were the, in the popular imagination, it was a story of, of, of unbroken misery from Northern Rock, Iraq through to today. But I think it is, a, it is a mark of actually the Conservatives' political success that they more or less managed to remove from our collective memory the fact that in the spring of 2010, people were looking actually quite perky. The economy was growing. Um, and after that, the, the economy um, stalled, um, living standards um, uh, slipped back, but Labour remained blamed much more than the Conservatives for Britain's economic problems. And it's a, a question we ask fairly regularly. And even now, getting on for four years into the government, um, four years even though the economy is now growing again, of, of missed targets if you look at what was being projected by the government soon after it came to office. Um, but it has not reduced the number of people <laughs> blaming, um, blaming Labour. Um, now, the story since uh, 2011 is of a slow, as you see, growth. We're now recovered cumulatively back to where we were, in fact, slightly better than we were in terms of consumer confidence uh, from the time of the uh, 2010 general election a bit short of where we were before Northern Rock, though not very far um, short of it. Um, and this is one reason why the two main parties are relatively close together. What I've got here is the underlying figures. Our, our latest um, poll this morning has a, 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 an eight-point Labour lead. Our poll yesterday had a four-point Labour lead. These are sampling fluctuations. What I put here is the, the underlying figures uh, that individual polls have been fluctuating around for the last um, two or three months. A six-point Labour lead. On those figures, if they were repeated in a general election, Labour would win on the edge of an overall majority. Tiny majority or just short, but easily the largest um, party. However, his, history tells us that in every Conservative government going back half a century, the Conservative government has improved its position and the Labour opposition has, has um, lost ground in the final year or so leading up to a general election. Um, the amounts vary, um, but a six-point Labour lead at this stage in the Parliament is something that history tells us the Conservatives ought pretty easily to overcome and to move ahead. However, the big question is whether history is any longer a reliable guide. And there are two reasons why this time it might be different. I'm not saying it will be different, but might be different. The first is that the Liberal Democrats, now down on 10%, are no longer the obvious place for protest votes to go. They're part of the government, and indeed the reason why they've lost more than half their votes since the last election is that they've not only gone into government, but they've gone into coalition with the Conservatives. So they've lost a lot of the 
uh, protest vote and lost a lot of the non-Labour left of centre um, votes. People who don't like the Conservatives but for one reason or another uh, don't want to vote Labour. So uh, I would expect all else being equal, the Liberal Democrats to regain some ground between now and the election. Um, but not to get back to the 23-24% um, they got last time. Um, I often add, I use that phrase, all else being equal, but of course perhaps um, this week it's worth dwelling on that a moment because of what's happening inside the Liberal Democrats. You know, I don't think people on the whole uh, care about uh, the fate of Lord Reynard, who is not um, a household name, or was not a household name throughout most of the country. Um, and if it blows over in the near future, I suspect it will be one of those stories that excites us all for a week or two and then is sort of lost in the mists of, of, of a vague collective memory. However, there is plainly a possibility that if the uh, saga does drag on because the two sides do get entrenched, if, if, if one side or other goes to law and so on, that this could, as well, indirectly but quite powerfully, damage the Lib Dem brand, uh, in which case maybe the Lib Dems will only get 10, 11, 12 percent at the general election. In that case, they probably would lose um, most of their seats because that would be too low a figure for the popular, often popular local Lib Dem MPs to, to, to resist um, desertion at that level. So, that's the first possible difference between now and the past. The second is UKIP. They're now on uh, around 12%. We've had them um, in most polls in third place ahead of the Liberal Democrats for some months now. Um, UKIP, again, unless they um, implode or are found to have even more weirdos that have come out in the last um, week or two, I think they will win the European Parliament elections this, this May. Uh, they may win them quite comfortably. Think of the European Parliament elections as a nationwide by-election. Think back of by-elections in the past when the Lib Dems were the party of protest, coming often from nowhere to take seats, going from 10% of the previous general election to 40 or 50% in a by-election. Um, at the moment, my sense, guess, feel, nothing more scientific than that, is that the UKIP will get 30% or so. We had them last week at 26% when we asked about European voting elections, and I would expect them to gain ground as they usually do as the polling day approaches. So UKIP 30%, perhaps a bit more. Labour in second place, perhaps around 25%, and the Tories below 20 Now think about that. A real possibility that there will be twice as many people in May voting UKIP as voting Conservative. Now, UKIP have done well in past European Parliament elections and have then faded. You go to a general election, people are choosing a government. It's no longer a sort of mid-term uh, bit of fun. Um, uh, and people who really don't want a Labour government go back and vote uh, Conservative. Um, so UKIP in 2009 European elections got 17%. 11 months later, general election get 3%. But it depends, in my judgment, on whether the Conservatives manage to get past the European Parliament elections and a possibly very, very bad result. The first time ever in the Conservatives' 180-year history, they're likely to come third in a nationwide contest. Whether they will be able to brush it off and hang together, or whether there will be uh, more internal conflicts as the Conservative rights uh, Sikhs are much more um, right-wing, Eurosceptic, uh, anti-immigrant policy, says to Cameron, you've got to move to see off the issues that um, appeal to the votes the Conservatives have lost to UKIP, or whether Cameron manages to hold on to a, a more centrist approach. Um, it's not so much the outcome of that conflict that matters, that will matter to a degree. It is whether that conflict is bitter and divisive and drawn out, and, and, and then the, the fact of a drawn out conflict tarnishes the conservative brand. But the bottom line here is this is the first time in modern British political history, by, by modern I mean you know, a century or so, that you've got a non-toxic party to the right of the conservatives that has real appeal. 
in the past, Conservatives had an effective monopoly of the right of centre vote. And the odd times you had the odd little surge of the BNP or the National Front or whatever, it is not really um, dented to that. Well, UKIP does have the power to dent the Tories, not by winning seats in the general election, they'll win none or, or maybe one or two in special circumstances, but because they pull votes away from the Tories and therefore seats go to the Labour or the Liberal Democrats because the Conservative vote is, is depressed. But, uh, which leads on to um, the real point about the next election, is that although at one level it'll be a battle between Labour and Conservative to be the largest party, the outcome of that will depend really on two quite distinct contests. Um, if you add up Labour and the Liberal Democrats there, you get to 49%. Add up Conservatives and UKIP, you get to 45%. I think that 49, 45 or thereabouts will be roughly the outcome of the next election. High 40s versus low to mid 40s. The question is really how does that 49 divide and how does that 43, 44, 45 divide? Um, will Labour hang on to the votes it's got from the Liberal Democrats since last time, or will the Liberal Democrats manage to claw them, many of them back? Can the Conservatives push UKIP's vote down to 4, 5, 6%, or will UKIP still manage to get? 10%, say, of the election. So if you let, let, let's take two opposite scenarios. Scenario one, um, UKIP hang on to 10% um, and the Lib Dems um, stay at around 10%, then you get the figures here. You get a Conservative, you get a Labour victory. Uh, certainly Labour largest party. But let's suppose the Tories managed to push UKIP down to 6 and the Lib Dems go up to 15, then the Tories become the largest party. The Tories will be in the high 30s, Labour in the low to mid 30s. So there's a two quite separate conflicts, Conservative UKIP, Labour Liberal. Not many voters of this coming election will, I think, waver directly between Labour and Conservative. A few will, but not many. Uh, and that's the normal state of affairs. The, in, in historically, there have been two general elections when there's been a clear direct shift of voters between Labour and Conservative. In 1979, when a lot of Labour skilled working class voters switched to Margaret Thatcher, and in, in 97, when quite a few Conservative middle class voters switched to, to Labour. The normality of British politics is that um, movements are in and out of don't know minor party um, um, willingness to turn out, those kinds of things. And then this will be an election where there will be a battle on the right and a battle on the left, and the outcome will, uh, will be a netting out. So finally, uh, what will be the issues at the core of that? Well, there will be a number. There will be taxation, there will be Europe, there will be immigration and so on, but it will, in the end, ultimately be the economy. And in both in terms of Labour trying to hold on to its vote and the Conservatives trying to pull back from UKIP, um, the economy will be the single biggest driver. And what we've got now is a really interesting battle between two rival narratives. Uh, when we, you go ask about who's best on the economy, as you see, Conservatives clearly ahead. When we ask people about which party's best for living standards, we have Labour ahead. And of course, there are now two, as it were, conflicting narratives. There's the narrative, we, the government, have taken the tough decisions. It's worked. The deficit is, deficit is coming down. Um, unemployment is coming down. Growth is, is uh, returning. And the old Obama line from 2012, don't give the keys back to the people who crashed the car. Then there's the Labour narrative. Um, it's uh, the people who have benefited are the rich. Ordinary people have been losing out. The economy may be growing. Uh, the living standards are falling. The new jobs are often low paid, uh, insecure, zero hours, part time. Um, and that we need a different approach if normal people are to um, benefit. And uh, I think the, the way the two battles, Labour Liberal, or UKIP um, will pan out will to a large extent depend 
on whether one of those two narratives becomes dominant in people's minds, the economy narrative or the living standards a narrative, which I hope leads on reasonably elegantly to the next presentation.